Greetings all, Ferrari Man 601 here. Welcome back to another 1400 scale diecast model aircraft review of this by Gemini Jets from their Gemini Max line. That's their line for military aircraft. The Rockwell B1 Lancer. The B1, it is military aircraft. It is a supersonic bomber, and it has been serving the United States Air Force in that capacity since the mid-1980s. Initially, a tender was put out by a few aviation manufacturers for a supersonic medium-to-long-range bomber aircraft, and a few answered that call. However, Rockwell's proposal for the B1, as it ultimately came to be known, was the winner. Basically, this aircraft needed to perpetuate the United States military strategy of constant alert, constant vigilance, and rapid response capacity. This was the height of the Cold War, in which the United States and the Soviet Union were engaged in a perpetual arms race trying to one-up each other constantly, but thankfully never really engaging the other, although we did have a few, shall we say, proxy incidents that did occur throughout those decades, and a lot of the consequences for those proxy incidents are still very much ongoing today. But the big takeaway from the Cold War era from both sides was an absolutely huge technological explosion. The Cold War saw basically aviation go from piston, propeller-driven airplanes to supersonic travel, not only in military capacities, but in civilian capacities in terms of Concorde. Also, it saw manned spaceflight and ultimately a manned lunar landing by 1969. So the Cold War really was a huge impetus for technological innovation in every sector, but particularly in the aerospace sector as we achieved and perfected supersonic flight, we achieved and perfected the the use of jet propulsion rather than piston engines driving propellers, and of course, ultimately, spaceflight and a lunar landing several times over. So that's the context and the climate from which this aircraft hails. Of course, this one later on toward the end of the Cold War era, the mid to late 70s, and then through the mid to late 80s when these aircraft were actually entering service by 1988 or so. But the B-1 remains in service today with the United States Air Force. There are about 60 of them still flying. One of the things, though, that the aircraft was designed to carry was nuclear ordnance. And quite thankfully, the world has not seen nuclear weapons used in the field of battle since 1945. But this is one of the aircraft that would be entrusted with carrying such devices, although officially the United States Air Force claims that the B-1s at very least no longer carry nuclear weapons. Is that true or not? They'll never tell us. But, be that as it may, the aircraft is very interesting, and it's rather unconventional in terms of its design. Yes, it's got a long and sleek supersonic fuselage, but it's also got variable geometry wings. Yes, a swing wing, which is something that Gemini jets have actually replicated on this 1400 scale model. Let's take a closer look at it. Before we take a closer look at this model, let's take a look at the box from whence it came. Coming in here from screen right, here we go. There is our Gemini Max box. And we'll zoom out a bit here so we can get more of it into frame. But there we go. Obviously, we've got a rendering of the B1 here front and center. Rendering appears to be ever so slightly larger than the actual model. Up at the top, though, a little bit different from the other Gemini Max boxes that we've seen so far. This one is brand limited edition collectible Rockwell B1 Lancer on 400 scale. This is something that's missing from the other Gemini Max models that I have got so far in the collection. Across the uh, bottom middle of the box, we have got uh, a rendering of the flag of Texas and Dynas there, Dynas Air, Air Force Base, of course, where the aircraft is based. Made for collectors, by collectors, and then there is your Gemini Max logo. And at the bottom left, your Look Inside tab. Across the bottom panel of the box, what do we have? The Gemini Max logo, one 400 scale die cast model with the selling features and points there. Right side panel, Gemini Max logo, Rockwell B1 Lancer, another smaller rendering of the aircraft. 1400 scale die cast, and then the item number is GMUSA084. Top panel, here we go. Gemini Max logo, adult collectible model. Warning, choking hazard, small parts, not for children under 14 years. And then the barcode. Left hand panel, Rockwell B1 Lancer, 1400 scale die cast, item number again. And then Gemini Max, there it is. Bottom panel of the box, here we go. Just as we saw on the top, limited edition collectible Rockwell B1 Lancer 1400 scale. Another rendering of the aircraft here, as real as it gets. 
Gemini Jets brings you the highest quality precision diecast transport aircraft in highly collectible limited editions with official license markings. Registration mark packaging is customized to each aircraft to enhance its collectible value. Proofreading. No apostrophe there. It's right. In other words, though, there you go. Everything being added monthly. There's your Facebook link there for the Gemini Jets page. Made in China. And then there it is. Copyright 2018, Gemini Jazz, Las Vegas, Nevada, USA. So there is your confirmation of this being a 2018 release. In the Look Inside tab, if we pop that open, there is the void. And then across the top, we have our write-up of the aircraft as well as some specifications. The write-up reads... The idea of the original B-1 slash B-1A was conceived back in the 1960s as a bomber by Rockwell International that would fly twice the speed of sound and eventually replace the B-52 and B-58 types. Cost development overruns and competition from advancing cruise missiles killed the program in 1977. With advancements in technology and an aging B-52 fleet, the B-1 idea was resurrected in 1981. Now known as the B-1B Lancer, the first aircraft flew on 18 October 1984. Deliveries of 100 production aircraft began in 1986 and were completed in May of 1988. Over the years, the B-1B has received several structural and technological upgrades and is planned to remain in service until the mid-2030s. As of January 2018, there were 62 operational B-1Bs remaining in service. Across the bottom here, we have got a list of current B-1B bases. They are Dinas Air Force Base in Texas, Ellsworth Air Force Base in South Dakota, Nellis Air Force Base in Nevada, and Edwards Air Force Base in California. Across the top, in a little bit of a departure in the box layout here from other models, Rockwell B-1 Lancer specifications. Length is 146 feet, wingspan 137 feet, height 34 feet, empty weight 192,000 pounds, cruising speed 830 miles per hour, range 5,900 miles, payload 125,000 pounds, and the engines are four GE F101, GE 102s. So, there you go with your box and your specifications and other things that are evident here. Before we get into the details on this wonderful little model by Gemini Jets in the Gemini Max line. Some more detailed specifications here follow on the B-1B Lancer. What is this aircraft? What is its role? Well, it is a long-range supersonic bomber. That is its mission and of course with the Cold War being in full swing when this aircraft was being developed, the idea was there needed to be a first strike option from the United States military because the thinking was at the time that the Soviet Union in particular would be trying to launch a first strike against the United States. And of course that was going to be most likely a nuclear strike and that was going to be a long range nuclear strike either with a bomber aircraft such as something like this or with an intercontinental ballistic missile. Therefore, this aircraft, along with aircraft like the B-52 and the SR-71 Blackbird, this aircraft was going to be part of basically the constant sentinel service. In other words, flying airplanes around the North Pole, constantly looking around at the Soviet Union and trying to see if they're up to anything. And if you see anything going on, well, that's going to be a game over for the Soviet Union before it would be game over for the United States. Yes, mutually assured destruction, ladies and gentlemen. That was what was going on during the Cold War, and, uh, well, that's why we have a whole bunch of aircraft from that era. It is a long-range supersonic bomber crewed by a minimum of four people in terms of what the flight crew is going to be. The crew allocations on the B-1 flights would have been you had an aircraft commander, a pilot, an offensive systems officer, and a defensive systems officer. So in other words, we've got two people who are going to be flying the airplane, we have one crew member who is above both of those people, and then we also have ourselves people who are strictly taking care of the ordnance on board in terms of offensive and defensive weaponry. This being a military aircraft and this being a strike aircraft, this one would have ordnance on board that are designed to take care of enemy targets in whatever general vicinity the airplane is flying, namely it's a bomber, so you're going to have people who are in charge of those weapon systems as well, in addition to the countermeasure systems on board, which I'm assuming are going to be any sorts of chaff and flare systems, as well as radar countermeasures, things of that nature. So, four people on board to fly this airplane. 
Overall length as the box said, 146 feet, that's 45 meters. Wingspan of 137 feet or 42 meters. And the swept wingspan, this is a variable geometry wingspan on this airplane. It's got a sweep wing, 79 feet or 24 meters in the swept configuration, which we'll see later on. The aircraft is 34 feet or 10 meters high. The overall wing area, 1,950 square feet or 181 square meters. Empty weight, as the box also said, 192,000 pounds or 87,090 kilograms. The gross weight, 326,000 pounds or 147,871 kilograms. With a maximum takeoff weight, therefore, of 477,000 pounds or 216,364 kilograms. Also, as the box mentioned, we have engines on this thing. We've got four of them. They are the General Electric F101 slash GE102 afterburning turbofan engines. So, in other words, we have got really powerful engines to start with, and then they've got afterburners as well. And the afterburners, of course, were going to be used during takeoff under heavy load, as well as for going supersonic, because, of course, this is a supersonic aircraft. Overall power output from those engines, that's 17,390 pound-feet, of dry thrust, that's 77.4 kilonewtons, and then when they lit the afterburners, they got a maximum of 30,780 pound-feet of thrust at sea level, or 136.9 kilonewtons. So you've got the option there of not using the afterburner if you don't require it, but if you do use the burner, you almost double the engine's power output times four, because we've got four of those engines. That power output allows the aircraft to achieve a maximum speed of 721 knots, that's 830 miles per hour, or 1,335 kilometers per hour at 40,000 feet. Maximum speed of the aircraft, therefore, Mach 1.25, so that is one and a quarter times the speed of sound, and again, assuming 40,000 feet there. The range on the aircraft is 5,100 nautical miles, which is 5,900 miles or 9,400 kilometers. And when we have a weapons load on board, we have got a maximum range of 7,600 kilometers, assuming that weapons payload is about 17,000 kilograms. Therefore, the overall combat range of the airplane in terms of leaving base, going out and accomplishing a mission, then coming back to base, that's 2,993 nautical miles from wherever the aircraft is based. Service ceiling was 60,000 feet or 18,000 meters. The maximum climb rate that they'll let us know about is 5,678 feet per minute. That's 28.84 meters per second. Overall wing loading across the aircraft, the aircraft under load, that is 167 pounds per square feet or 820 kilograms per square meter. The overall thrust to weight ratio on the aircraft was 0.28 in terms of the amount of power per unit of mass of the aircraft, either by dry weight or by weapons loadout in terms of the overall payload capacity. The aircraft is outfitted to carry weaponry, namely bombs. That is the point of a bomber after all. The aircraft has six external hard points in terms of places on the aircraft exterior where they can mount ordnance. The aircraft was designed to carry a whole slew of weapon systems, bombs, all kinds of other avionics equipment as well in terms of extra instrumentation that could be fitted under the wings or in the belly or in the belly cargo bay of the aircraft as well. In terms of the explosive ordnance that the aircraft could carry, a whole menagerie of weapon systems. We've got the Mark 82 uh, aerial inflatable retarder system. So in other words, you've got fragmentary munitions that can explode in the air and then hit multiple targets. You've got the Mark 84 general purpose bombs. You have naval mines, the Mark 65 version. Cluster bombs, the uh, CBU 87 and 89 and 97 series, the CBU 103 through 105 series. Those are munitions dispenser units. Again, they'd be an air burst and they would send individual shells out to individual targets in some cases. You've got the AGM-154 joint standoff weapon, you've got the AGM-158C anti-ship missile, you've got the AGM-158 uh, air to surface missile, so in other words you could attack land targets and maritime targets, and then also, most infamously, this aircraft also was outfitted to carry the B-61 and B-83 nuclear weapons, so this was a nuclear armed aircraft. Supposedly, the B-1s no longer carry nuclear ordnance, but I'm going to say that they still do, whether or not they want us to know about it. So, you've got an aircraft that is capable of supersonic flight, and its cruise speed would be around Mach 0.125, but you've also got an aircraft that's also versatile in terms of the munitions that it can carry, and 
A military aircraft, that's its job, and that's what it can do, and obviously the B-1 was well outfitted for that task. Now to take a closer look at some of the macrocosmic details available here on this Gemini Max rendition of the B-1. First of all, in terms of the overall proportions of the model, it's about 5 inches long with about a 4.5 inch wingspan with the wings unswept like they are right now. It's really not all that dimensionally dissimilar from the 1400 scale Concorde that we took a look at a couple of months ago. And of course, being a macrocosmically similar aircraft to Concorde in terms of we've got four engines and we are a supersonic aircraft, yeah, I suppose that's not really all that surprising. Of course, though, very different roles both of those aircraft were developed in order to achieve. But in terms of what we've got going on here, we have the typically good Gemini Max gray, battleship gray paint finish there, and it is a little bit abrasive in terms of the paint finish there. That's something that we have seen on many a Gemini Max model, and uh, basically all of them that are painted in that battleship gray color do have that somewhat rough, abrasive surface texture, and uh, I do like that quite a lot. It just adds a sense of ruggedness, which is something that I suppose you would associate with a military aircraft. Other details that you see here in terms of the general shapes and proportions of everything, there's the nose section with the cockpit windows, which are curiously removable. We'll take a look at that a little bit later on, but the canopy actually does come off of this aircraft. That's something very unique in 1-400 scale. Typically details like that in terms of things being removable, that's generally reserved for the 1-200 scale models. But no, this is a 1-400 and we do have removable cockpit windows there, so we'll take a look at that. But overall the shape of the nose looks good. We also have those little canard winglets below and slightly ahead of the cockpit windows, and uh, they're all there. They're actually modeled, they're not just tampo print markings there like the canard winglets on Concorde were. Nope, those are actual winglets. They are there in three dimensions, as you can see here from nose on. There you go. Not too bad. Rears of the cockpit, you do have that slight hump section of fuselage before it starts to taper down toward the wing spar area where the wings are then mounted. And then the wings themselves, obviously, they are unswept right now. They're basically straight across, and uh, that's the low speed takeoff and landing configuration for the airplane. You can see, though, particularly from directly nose or tail on, that we do have a little bit of wing droop going on there. That's something that is only evident when the wings are extended here in the unswept position. When you sweep them back, the wings are more or less straight and level. So, interesting to note, is that a defect? Maybe it is. However, it does mean, though, that the wings do have that true-to-life variable geometry feature. So, if they're not quite straight and level when they're in one configuration versus another, I'll take it. I'll definitely give it a pass, only because it allows the wings to be functional. It adds a feature that you don't get on many 1-400 scale models. Not to mention, though, that most aircraft ever produced do not have variable geometry wings. So, okay, we'll take what we can get, and uh, I really don't want to dock too many points off of this one for that because it is a cool feature to have that variable geometry wing structure. Toward midship again, you do see the engine nacelles the there on the uh, basically just below the leading edges of the wings. You start to see the air intakes there on the engine nacelles. And uh, another parallel with Concorde, very similar sorts of engine intakes in that uh, these, I believe, would be variable geometry to allow the air to slow down, come down to subsonic speed before the engine ingests that air, and then, of course, it can be uh, mixed with the fuel and then set alight and sent out the back at unspeakable velocity. And then, of course, all of it gets lit up again when the afterburners light up. So there you go. You can see the intake and exhaust sides of all four engines, the nacelles nicely proportioned and nicely positioned. You do have that silver detail there on the trailing edge of the nacelle around the afterburner section of the engine and all that looks good. Landing gear as you can see we have our main gear and nose gear. We've got four wheels on each main gear and then we have got two wheels on the nose gear. That looks good. Perhaps the wheels look ever so slightly too big at this scale. Again, I don't really know. I don't really feel like taking measurements of these legs but um, I don't know. I think it looks good enough. Perhaps slightly disproportionately large but again it's not really something that I'm going to be docking points for this thing on because, again, the wheels roll very nicely and they do look good, all things considered, albeit, again, perhaps just a little bit too big. 
tail section there, there's the tail cone and the empennage. You can see the tail cone is well below the rest of the vertical stabilizer. And then you can see that the horizontal stabilizers are mounted somewhat up the vertical stabilizer. It's not just there in the tail cone, so perhaps not where you'd expect to see horizontal stabilizers in terms of an airliner context. But here, obviously, we have got some supersonic aerodynamic considerations to make, so there you go in terms of the disposition of the empennage on the aircraft. But it looks good. Everything looks reasonably straight there. Perhaps the horizontal stabilizer also slightly crooked relative to the vertical stabilizer. But be that as it may, looks pretty good. I don't have really any qualms with this one. Again, the wings not quite being level on the ground. Eh. I don't know. I, I don't really let it bother me much because, again, you have the swing wing design, and that is definitely something very unique in 1400. Taking a look here from the nose at the B1. We'll zoom in as close as we dare. There we go. And there we are. You can see the First of all, the structure of the nose cone, that looks good with the slightly darker paint relative to the rest of the aircraft with the radar dome area, that looks good. Also, you can see that we have got the, uh, basically the rangefinder lines and then the receptacle for the aerial, aerial refueling port right there. Obviously, that's something for the benefit of the tanker boom operator, so for in-flight refueling, you're going to have yourself um, basically unlimited range. And then, obviously, the boom operator needs some guidance in terms of flying the boom into the receptacle. But that's cool that you can see that detail. It looks very nice, and I do like it. There is the overall disposition of our landing gear. You can see that maybe we do have a little bit of an asymmetry there on the main gear. Could also just be a slight artifact of the angle from which we're looking. But you can see that on screen right, aircraft left, that main gear perhaps looks a little bit different from the right gear in terms of its angle relative to the ground. But, again... Not really something that I'm too concerned about. Engine nacelles, the intake sides of them, you can see here, they look pretty nice, I must say. Can't really divine any detail inside the engine nacelles. Again, we're, we're talking about very small scale here. The intakes there on each engine, only about, I don't know, a millimeter high, two millimeters high at most. So very, very tiny details. But again, rendered quite nicely, I gotta say, good effort. There are wings, leading edges of the wings, not much to see from this profile view, but you can see that we do not quite have a straight and level condition here on the ground. That left wing, screen right, is definitely drooping a bit, and it has some sort of slop there in the mechanism that allows them to swing. Similarly, with the empennage there, you can see the vertical and horizontal stabilizers there looking aft, and you do definitely have a bit of an asymmetry, a little bit off level there with the empennage, particularly in the horizontal stabilizers. But all in all, not too bad. I do like, again, the detail that is visible on the nose, as well as those cockpit windows. Again, you can see up there. Looks pretty cool. Definitely a pretty high mark still, albeit we do have a droopy left wing. From the starboard side of B1, we'll zoom in a bit more, and there we go. There is our nose structure there, our cockpit windows, our starboard canard wing that you can see there, just behind the pitot arrays here for our air data, and then the canard wing itself, that looks cool. Also, you can see the nose landing gear doors obviously open, cockpit windows, and you can see the shut line between the bottom of the canopy and the rest of the fuselage, because that is, of course, a removable panel. Moving aft, there you go. You can see this structure here, which I think is some sort of an avionics sensor, either for radar or perhaps for a guidance system if they're carrying uh, air-to-surface missiles, something like that. Interesting. Also, you can see that we have got some sort of uh, insignia here. Not quite sure what it is. I can't quite make it out, but it looks pretty good nonetheless. Moving aft toward midships, there we go. Here's our wing tip. Do we have a strobe here on the wing tip? Yes, we do. Right here, we have got ourselves a strobe there for our starboard wing, a green strobe, obviously. And then below that, and slightly after, we have got our engine nacelles there, times four. Moving aft further, there we go. We have a little bit of a vent structure here, and then we have the USAF roundel, and then we have got our Dynas Air Force Base um, coat of arms there, squadron number. Very, very nice. 
tail cone, some sort of a hatch here for probably um, auxiliary power unit servicing or perhaps some sort of uh, electronic uh, bay for some of the countermeasure systems on board the aircraft. Not entirely sure, but not too bad. Vertical stabilizer disposition there above the tail cone and then the horizontal stabilizers affixed there too. Not too bad at all, I've got to say. I do generally like the proportions of this model, um, particularly in profile. It sort of hides some of the uh, the asymmetries in the wing, but definitely it does look the part. It looks very, very nice. Take a look from the tail on the B1. There we go. Zoom in as close as we can. Not too bad. There we go for the most part. Yes, you can also see the uh, issues of symmetry that we have here with the wings. Now the left wing on the screen left now. Things are symmetrical in terms of our point of view. Yep, definitely a droop there relative to the right wing, which does look pretty straight. And uh, similarly, you can see that we have got ourselves that slight right can't with our horizontal stabilizer. So, eh, it is what it is in my book. But here you can see the exhaust sides of the engines. They look good. Nice uh, silver paint there on the exhaust sides around the afterburner assembly. And then of course we have got our nose and main landing gear here visible from the rear section. I also like that top side profile that you can see with the hump coming from the back side of the cockpit area and then moving across with this flare downward toward the engine nacelles here with our little strakes here just separating the flow on the top sides of the nacelles. That looks really nice and looks very, very dramatic. Definitely a fan of this angle of the B1. Uh, beyond all that though, yeah, what you see is what you get. It's a, again, it's a reasonably small model, so some of the smaller details are a little bit harder to see, but they are there, and you can just see some of that with the shut lines across the top side of the fuselage. Looks very nice, and I just do like that overall shape, how it expands out toward the wings, and it almost re looks somewhat reminiscent of a lifting body in its own right, and I'm sure the fuselage does generate a little bit of lift by itself, but Obviously, it's not a lifting body, it just looks like it's taken some design cues, perhaps, therefrom. And now from the port side of the B1, zooming in again, moving forward. There we go, there's the port side of our nose and cockpit area. We can see another insignia just below the port side of the cockpit. Not too bad. Also, we have got our nose cone and then our pitot tubes again ahead of the port canard winglet there on the nose. So, again, looking good, as does the port side of the main uh, of the nose landing gear door and the nose landing gear itself with the strut and the wheel and tire assembly. And again, all of the wheels do roll on this one. Looks very, very nice. And then as we start to move aft, there's the hump section behind the cockpit, and then it starts to taper down and expand laterally out toward our wing spar area, where, of course, we then do have our wings. There's a red strobe here because this is the port side wing. Engine nacelles here on the port side of the aircraft, and then moving arrears toward our aft section, our tail cone, and then our vertical stabilizer with the horizontal stabilizer mounted about, I don't know, 35, 40% of the way up on the vertical stabilizer. Looking good, another USAF roundel here on the port side tail cone. And then all in all, just looks very, very nice. It is uh, certainly a little bit of an offbeat model in terms of the others in my collection, and a little bit of an offbeat model as well in terms of what Gemini jets generally give us. But again, I like it. I think it fits very well, and it's been reasonably nicely executed, especially with the swing wing, which we're gonna take a look at now. Right, so the swing wing idea. Well, obviously the swing wing design is something that comes about of having a very high and wide working range of speed for an aircraft. So a large aircraft like this, one that can be rather heavily laden in terms of its payload, requires a lot of lift in order to get off the ground. And wings that are straight across generally generate better lift at lower speeds than wings that are swept back. And this is one of the reasons why on most modern airliners you will see wings that are swept back to some extent. They're not directly straight across, but they're also not the absolute 
other extreme end of the spectrum in terms of being a delta wing, being very highly swept and not even being an airfoil shape, at least in terms of a traditional airfoil, in terms of being straight across with a lot of curving shape over top. They're a delta wing, which is a completely different design. But this is the compromise between the two, and it basically allows infinite variability within that compromise between a straight across wing and a highly swept wing. Gemini Max here, in their 1400 rendition of the B1, they have given you the ability to sweep the wing back, and it does so just like that. There you go. So now you can have the wings totally swept back, and that's the furthest uh, wing sweep that you have currently available here. And of course, we can sweep them back the other way. There you go. So you can see that the wings are linked together. All you need to do is push one or the other, and then of course, they will just do their thing and sweep back and forth. It's the uh, first model aircraft that I have actually that has this sort of feature. The action is very smooth. It will stay uh, in whichever position you put the wing so you don't have to be all the way extended or all the way retracted. There are basically infinite shades of gray in between all of that so you can decide where you want to have that for your different display options in terms of which phase of flight you want to display the model if you've got it up on a stand, but there it is. It looks pretty good, I've got to say, and uh, yep, the uh, proportion completed there with the uh, wing swept back. Now this thing really looks like it is in flight and it's going someplace in a hurry. Now going freehand to take some closer looks at some of the details that perhaps we couldn't see earlier on. There is our nose and cockpit area. It looks pretty good. And of course the uh, general proportion and disposition of everything there with our air refueling port, our uh, radar dome nose tip, pitot tubes, and then our countered winglets, and then the cockpit canopy area. It looks good. And then top side here on the fuselage you can see more details going on in terms of our tampo printing. Not really much graphics wise on the fuselage. You can see that we have got some details here uh, with our USAF roundel there and then really on the vertical stabilizer is the only other place that we have any real graphics on the aircraft but it looks good I've got to say and uh, again it uh, looks appropriate. Graphic sizes are proportionate and then the little bits of color that are actually here they look good. So definitely high marks here in terms of the graphics detailing. Obviously our wings and their swept back configuration, they look a whole lot more proportionate and straight and level now. So, well, that's really well done. Can't really complain about any of that. And then just our uh, engine nacelles there from a little bit closer up. Looks good. Looks really, really good. Don't really have any qualms about any of that. And then your nice graphics there on the vertical stabilizer. Looks pretty, pretty good. The other detail that we've got to take a look at is the uh, canopy here is removable. You can see that it's a slightly different color from the rest of the fuselage, and we have transparent windows here because it is removable. So we reach down with the hand of God and we lift that off. Let me put that aside. There you go. And now you can see the cockpit area on the B1. We come up over top, and you can just see that we have got ourselves in here just two seats it would appear you can see that we have got our holes there where little pegs on the bottom of the canopy fit in but all in all that's about all we've got there in terms of the cockpit detail there is no attempt at trying to model an instrument panel or anything of that sort just the two little seats but um, you know even though there's not all that much to see in here I do appreciate that they took the time to try and uh, show us something, and they uh, integrated that feature into the model. It uh, doesn't look bad, and it certainly doesn't take anything away from the model. So, a little bit of an unorthodox feature, perhaps, but it's a feature. And uh, I definitely have to say good on them for at least attempting to do something different, and uh, I, I like it nonetheless. Coming back here, we'll get the Hand of God back in position. We will get our canopy back on and there you go done so that's everything reassembled not too bad at all from the top side there pretty good in terms of your detailing there top side pulling out a little bit the top sides of the wings looks good
definitely looks good and I really do like that top side profile there. It just looks like, uh, well, looks like a dart. <laughs> so, yeah, it's a supersonic 200,000 pound dart. Not bad in the least. And then, of course, coming back out through here, we can get our wings back extended. Good. We took the canopy off by accident. Oh, well. But, yeah, there it is. Not bad at all proportion-wise. Canopy back into position. There we go. That's the view we were looking for. Not bad. Not bad at all. Certainly cool. I like how the shadows are falling around this thing as well. Very sort of different perspective and different proportions there with how the light's coming in, but it looks good. It really does look good. And uh, again, really not too many real substantive complaints from me. Obviously, we've got the wings that are a little bit droopy when they're extended, but really, am I going to complain about that so much? Eh, not really. It's, uh, it's a very nicely done model. A little bit offbeat, but I do like it all the same. So there it was, rendered in 1 400 scale by Gemini Jets, the B1 Lancer. This model is rather unique, not only in my collection, but in my opinion, in the whole Gemini Jets lineup. Yes, they do make a lot of military models, that's why they have the Gemini Max sub-brand of Gemini Jets, but this one is really unique. It's a supersonic, medium to long-range bomber, and as far as Gemini Jets are concerned, it's got some details on it that you just don't see on too many others of their models, namely the swing wings, which actually do swing, and the removable cockpit canopy. Not entirely sure why they went for the removable canopy. I understand that perhaps they were trying to make the cockpit windows transparent so that they're not just printed on there in black like they are in most of their airliners. But at the same time, yeah, th there are seats in there, and we saw that, and you can see that there is some detail in there, so they went through the effort to put in that little extra feature, and it looks cool. At the same time, though, at 1 400 scale, it's really tiny. Those seats are maybe 2 millimeters high, so it's it's small, and of course, you then, then have to have some sort of way to secure the canopy with those four peg holes that we took a look at as well, and that obviously is not at all scale correct, not at all correct to how the original aircraft would actually look, but... It's interesting nonetheless, and I, I think that the model is better for having features like this rather than simply them taking the easier way out and just omitting them altogether. So I do appreciate the effort that they took to add those features to the model, and it, it adds a little something. I'm definitely going to say that it's richer for having it rather than it being something for me to sit back and say, you know, it, it would have been would have been nice if they tried. So they did try, and it is nice, and I definitely appreciate that. The B-1, though, it's an aircraft that's probably going to remain flying for quite some time. Although, in a twist of irony, the aircraft that, in theory, it was designed to replace, the B-52, that's another aircraft that's going to remain flying for quite some time, perhaps even into the 2100s. Yes, it's altogether possible that 80 years from now, the B-52 will still be flying. Some of those aircraft are fast approaching their 100th birthday already, and they're still in active service. So we'll see what the future holds for the B-52 as well as for this, the B-1. Theoretically, it's more capable replacement aircraft. So they're still serving concurrently, and as far as I'm aware, there are no plans to remove the B-1 from service anytime soon. Likewise, no plans to remove the B-52 from service either. So... Be that as it may, we've got this wonderful B-1 Lancer by Gemini Jets. It looks good, and it's a fine addition to my collection. And if you're looking for military aircraft just to add to your display, yep, looks good. Definitely, this is a good model. I'm willing to ignore some of the faults in it, such as the droopy left wing, as well as the slightly crooked horizontal stabilizer. It looks fine. It's in 1 400th scale. These are really tiny things in reality. So, again, the fact that they were able to cram in the amount of detail that they managed to do time and time again, hats off to them. Wonderful production effort, and it's really just a very nicely done model here by Gemini Jets. Until next time, though, I do hope that you have enjoyed this one. It was a lot of fun making it. Ferrari Man 601 saying thank you very much for watching, and of course, we will see you soon.